Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. We will now move into the uh, Q&A. Certainly keep your questions coming. I have a bunch of them tabulated here, but I can multitask. I'm sure I can um, handle more questions coming in as we go. So please keep them coming. I'm going to start with um, a, a commodity price outlook uh, thing, and I'm going to go uh, ask each of you in turn uh, for a bit of an outlook, and I'll try and move from metal to metal as is, as is appropriate. So in the order that you presented, Ian, you are certainly um, bullish on copper. Uh, just for the sake of argument, why don't you tell us what your outlook is for copper, uh, maybe copper price a year from now, and, and maybe within that outlook, what you think the key things are that an interested copper investor should watch for in the market. Uh, what, yeah, what, what are you watching for as an interested copper investor, signs of, of the market turning around? Well, obviously, I'm more bullish on silver and gold than everyone else on the battle right now in the world. I know, I'm just making you talk about copper because it's in your company. But, but I'm the only copper guy up here, so yeah, exactly. I got the question. And uh, well, like I said in my presentation, I, I, we're, I was really bullish on copper in February. I thought we were going into a bull market for copper that we hadn't been in, in for years, and it was, it was a very exciting time. You know, with that, that being delayed, maybe six months or so, it's a good opportunity. And we're actually trying to buy more copper assets right now and are close to doing that. So we're using the opportunity that way instead. But but I think that, that the supply demand for copper hasn't gone anywhere, you know, and um, there's uh, like we, we all know it. And I know you've written about it is the, the electrification of the world and not just the, um, you know, the electric cars, but the power to get them, the green power, like uh, the windmills and the solar all need you know, multiples more power than, than historic sources and and um, and then the transmission to get the power to the cars and uh, it it's you know I, um, I saw a presentation on it really where the fellow compared copper as the new oil because and it, it really struck stuck with me that that's that's the case because um, over the last hundred years you've had oil and combustion engines. But in the next hundred years, it's all going to be electricity, and copper is really what drives electricity. So it's not a far fetched I think it, it's reality. So I, I think in the in the medium to to long term, we're right back where we were, and even bigger, I think, because even as you know, we've seen in China, we're already having stimulus and infrastructure, and people going back to work. And so when that does happen, I think we'll be in a better position than we were in February and then in the fall. Uh, but in the short term, I'm actually a bit surprised by the copper price because, um, you know, Peru is one of the biggest producers and a lot of their copper mines are shut down, right? And on the other hand, um, you know, China's back at work and the government is is giving interest-free loans and, and um, pushing people to stockpile copper. So you would think that that, that dynamic would give a, a higher spot price right now, but it, we haven't seen that yet. Gotcha. Yeah, no, fair enough. There's that, that overriding... Questions about growth sentiment can weigh on that, but uh, weigh on on the copper price, even though the fundamentals suggest otherwise. But yeah, it does seem to me like uh, like that's setting up for a recovery sometime in the near term here. Uh, Joe, moving on to you, since you're the more silver focused member of the panel, uh, what comments do you have about the current silver price? Do you think silver? Um, I've had questions from subscribers, for instance, of late about whether it's time yet to move to rotate profit from gold investments into silver. What do you have to say about, about silver performance, the silver slingshot activity, silver as an industrial metal in an in, in a environment where people have questions about growth? What do you have to say about silver pricing? Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm a geologist and not an economic economist, but um, I feel comfortable where, where silver's at. I think silver will uh, at least keep pace with gold. And then maybe you'll see an inversion of the va relative values. Um, and I think um, overall, it, um, with in particular, like a project with uh, like Santa Ana, you're on the upper 20% of the grade curve, and it's going to be very resilient to uh, fluctuations in silver prices. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish. And the other thing too is that is that uh, although Santa Ana will produce more uh, value from gross metals in silver, uh, the gold is also extremely high grade. Uh, so it's a it's a dual play, uh, in a sense. Uh, but, gotcha. 
parts of the deposit are 800 silver, 800, 800 silver to gold. Parts of the deposit are four to, four to one silver to gold, but more silver, but a good gold, high grade gold, Florida, to make the project also resilient. Gotcha. Um, the next two, Darren and Brian, are both uh, clearly the gold focused members of the panel here. Um, I'll, I'll, t I'll alter the question slightly for each of you. Brian, uh, just because I haven't asked, what's your outlook on the price of gold? Uh, somebody's got to give a number. Yeah, sure. No. Um, look, you. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you say Brian or Darren? I, I did say Brian. I, I have a slightly different version for Darren. Okay, sure. Yeah, look, happy to think about it. I mean, there's been so many positive drivers for gold over the last uh, you know, several years, and those are coming to a head now. And you talked about interest rates. You talked about the level of debt, and, and that's all driving you know, stronger prices. And here we hit at 1730, and there's resistance now, and we're trading. And, and I think you're going to see it break through that. Um, I'm pretty comfortable you're going to see this move and set all-time highs again. And, you know, we're probably going to see a two in front of this. Um, and that bodes very well for all of us that are looking for gold, developing gold, or producing gold. And the really uh, the the flip side to it is is that even at this price or prices that are below here, we're all doing very well, and there's fun flow in here. So build catalysts. We can drive very profitable businesses at the prices that you're seeing now. Um, but I'm optimistic that with the response to the COVID pandemic and the increasing level of debt and the challenge of doing anything with interest rates. And you talked about the impact of real interest rates on gold and the correlation. It's hard to envisage a scenario where you don't see continued positive movement in the gold price. We, we are aligned in our thinking, my friend. Um, Darren, I guess I'll, the, the slightly altered version of the question that I have for you is, do you have a bit of a, what's your sense of the window that we have here for this gold bull market. I mean, we've been waiting for a long time. Is this going to be a short-lived event? Is this going to be a long-lived event? And within that, how do you think majors are approaching um, the deal uh, side of a gold bull market? Like, will there be a rush to do deals um, early in the market because of a shortage of assets? Um, you know, you've worked with majors as well. How yeah, what do you think about sort of the how this market will play out over sort of time frame and moves from majors? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I mean, I would agree. I think we're in a very constructive environment here for gold uh, for all the reasons that, that we've described. And I think this really started, you know, well before the pandemic kicked in. You know, you look both short term and long term drivers. I think we've been kind of moving us towards the start of a run with respect to gold prices. Uh, and I do think it'll be sustained. I think the, the it's going to take a while to recover from all the money that we're printing right now, from you know interest rates that are sitting at percent, and from from the the loss of employment that we've seen, um, be it short term or otherwise. It's going to take a while to recover from that. So I think that's really kind of speed up the momentum that we're seeing in the gold space right now. So yeah, I think we're 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 still in the early innings. I think we've got a long runway ahead of us with respect to uh, gold, and uh, I think it is quite constructive. Now stepping back. Majors, uh, you know, they've been quiet for some time uh, with focuses on balance sheets and uh, getting their cost structure under control. And I think they've done a, a really good job. And typically what you see is as things start to change, as momentum starts to gain, share prices begin to appreciate, generalists come into the sector, there's more pressure to, to grow. And so you'll see things accelerate. And I think that's something that'll snowball. I, I, I wouldn't say that it's going to happen early or late. I think it's just going to accelerate as we see more deals happening and less opportunities out there. And so I think it'll put more pressure on business development groups across the planet as they're looking out there to see well, what can we do. And just to kind of tie up that thought, uh, we really haven't seen any major discoveries in some years. And so the, the kind of the, the, the quality of product out there, the, the number of opportunities out there is smaller than the last time we went into a cycle. So it could become um, more, more frenetic than it has in the past. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's certainly an interesting aspect of every market to watch and, uh, yeah, and try and play to some extent. Uh, Carrie, you certainly touched on Palladium in your presentation. Uh, the Palladium space, interesting, obviously huge momentum in the Palladium price going into this year. And then COVID hit, auto demand or auto production fell off a cliff. But um, Palladium production also took a major hit with a lot of mine closures. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, can you just expound expound on that a bit? You uh, remain optimistic for the Palladium price. Do you think that those two pro and con forces are going to end up balancing each other out? What's your take on it? Well, obviously, um, for a brief period of time, uh, virtually every uh, auto manufacturer in the world was shut down, uh, as well as every catalytic converter manufacturer. So you had the Russians, uh, Norilsk. Um, uh, I'll just back up a little bit. The world Palladium production is threefold. Um, about a third comes from Russia, about a third comes from South African producers, and about a third from recycling. The recycling um, got cut back big time, but in China, it, it didn't really stop at all. So there was, uh, Norilsk also kept mining, although they didn't mine as much in the first quarter of this year as they did last year. Uh, last year, they, I, I won't get into the reasons, but um, so you still have half of the world's production going, with the market stopped. And it really surprised me. I thought actually that Palladium was going to get a bigger hit. But going forward, when these car companies all start manufacturing again, they're going to need Palladium. There's no substitute for for um, Palladium in auto catalysts. And every car sold in the world needs anywhere from three to seven grams of Palladium. And there's no stopping that. So uh, until... Um, as long as, of course, car companies aren't making cars, um, sure, um, I think it, Palladium is going to stay weak. But as soon as they all ramp up, and they are going to ramp up, and people are going to start buying cars again, uh, it's not like the rest of the business where you know people are not going to be able to make up those those meals out that, 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 that the restaurants have lost. People who are going to buy a car before are still going to need a car. Maybe it, it'll be delayed six months or even a year, but people are going to still buy cars. And uh, palladium is still going to be in shortage. It was in about a 10% deficit. In other words, the world was short about 10% of the palladium it needed. There are no palladium mines under construction other than uh, Platt Reef with Ivanhoe, which is a few years out, and it's 200. It's less than 2% of world production. So you're not. Uh, there's no replacement coming, and I think you're going to see a big, big bull market on platinum and uh, sorry palladium and somewhat platinum, because uh, at a higher price, they're going to start substituting some platinum, and and um, platinum is going to going to go up as well. Hmm. All right, there's our commodity uh, commodity question done. Um, I'm going to go to some company specific questions here. Um, uh, Ian, what did the company pay to B2 Gold to get um, get the asset, and is there a royalty on it? Uh, 10 million shares and a uh, 2% royalty. Okay. Straightforward. Um, and then I have a question about, actually I have a couple for you and Joe on Columbia. Makoa in the South used to have a significant number of FARC terrorists in the area. Um, what kind of risk does that currently present at the Makoa project? Mm, it's not true currently. So historically, for sure, there was it was FARC territory, and you couldn't work there for decades. And when when B two drilled it in two thousand eight, they had to have uh, the army with them. So there was historically it was a problem in that area. But we've been working there the last year, and with no with no army and and, it's, and no issues, and having making some good success with the local communities, and and uh, it's just not uh, an issue now with the peace treaty being a couple years old already. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit? You just raised money. You had to upsize the financing, which is obviously a good sign. Do you want to talk about um, the investors who are coming in? Is it any? Is it different? Has it changed at all um, in the last while? I'm always interested to see who is uh, participating in financing. And can you also talk a little bit about what they liked? Were they copper investors? Were they gold investors? Were they simply? Were they generalists? Were they commodity specific? What can you say about your recent financing? Mm. So, so mostly not, not, not generalists, still, uh, still gold bugs. <laughs> but, uh, okay. um, so us global, who was our largest institutional shareholder, um, um, returned. So, so they, they participated. We had, uh, some new institutions like Sprott, uh, participate for the first time. Um, and then a lot of, uh, of our existing shareholders and others were, were really Canadian high net worth, okay. but mostly okay. they're interested. In our in drilling the gold copper at Big Red this summer, right? Okay. Everyone liked that the uh, the optionality on the big copper projects for the future, and and really that limits the downside risk on a ten million market cap junior because you have those assets. But but they're excited about what we get with a drill discovery this summer. What that would mean for the stock? 
Gotcha. Okay. And then the other question that I wanted to do is about Big Red and um, Copperbowl. Uh, you're obviously starting at Ridge with drilling, but you have a lot of interesting targets. Some of them earlier, like the new that limestone conductivity target or the Terry area with all the boulders. I mean, it's a little bit like a kid in a candy store when I look at your yeah. targets. So what, uh, yeah, can you talk, talk us through the exploration plan in terms of you're going to start at Ridge because that's the best defined target, but what would you love to be able to accomplish uh, there this summer? Well, the plan is to it was what and we've had a we've had lots of conversations about with this internally is to is to develop a couple other targets to that kind of stage drill ready this summer so we can move the rigs onto them. So that's what we're and we're going to get up there early to do that. So the plan right now is to get um, uh, geology teams up there mapping and sampling maybe within a couple of weeks even as soon as the snow allows us to um, ridge. Can't get onto Ridge. It's the high, of course the best target. It's the highest elevation, so <laughs> so we can't start there. But but we can't start on those other projects like Terry is is lower elevation. So so we're going to get teams up there to progress that work as quick as we can this summer to uh, to get them drill ready. Also, cool. All right, thanks, Ian. Um, Joe, I'm going to move on to you. Uh, I got a similar question for you that I uh, received. For Ian, can you talk about the risk factors um, around your projects in Colombia? Um, yeah, uh, how how does that work in terms of? We have an uh, ex-military special forces guy and captain in charge of security, and uh, what we find, well, we rank all our targets by location, uh, and, and I'm sorry, and the and the intensity of the security risk. So that goes from for us, it's blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And Santa Ana is luckily a blue, minimum, minimal, minimal uh, security. Uh, we have increased security on some of our projects to the south. Basically, anywhere where you still have a, a uh, drug route or arms route to the sea, uh, so through the Chaco into the ocean, or, or uh, uh, routes into friendly neighboring countries, or I'm sorry, segments of the population that are friendly to the guerrillas like Ecuador and, and Venezuela, of course. Um, but overall, Santa Ana is probably, I mean, it's, it's secure as lots of places I've worked in the van, honestly. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, that's a nice uh, sense. Now, Santa Ana is special. It really is, you know. Is you can't find that everywhere, but, but that part of Tolima is just very, uh, very placid, very, very long mining culture. Um, if you get the, when you tend to get the community on board, the gorillas tend to move off. That was certainly the sense when I went to Colombia and sort of got my head wrapped around jurisdictional risk there. It's very local, right? It can change significantly one area to the next, and it totally depends on the local population's history of mining, how much the gorillas were in charge of that mining operation, and so how much of a foothold the gorillas have and how much that has persisted. So, and it can change, you know, over tens of kilometers, that can be very different. I wouldn't say 10, but yeah. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, Northern Antioquia near Berlin, uh, Berlin obviously, where, where continental loss and gel was very bad quite a number of years ago now. Um, but I don't really think there's been violence directed towards uh, uh, North Americans uh, for over seven years. Yeah, you don't see kidnapping so much as an industry. You see more the military or the guerrillas attacking police and and and, uh, and not not too many, not too much in the way of uh, uh, regular people. Yeah. Okay. Let's focus in on um, the geology a bit. Can we? Um, you you've went through your model and your your drill uh, plan to outline these ore shoots within these uh, known veins and projected veins. Can you give us a little bit of a geology lesson about why you expect those ore shoots within those veins to be so regular? Because that's obviously a fundamental assumption in your outlook. Yeah, it is. But um, one, we got two well-drilled it's that the dimensions and the grades are very similar. They're actually still open, but we're calling them 200 meter strikes. And uh, we have drilling to, um, I think the deeps is actually 200 meters and we're projecting that to 300 meters. But um, what's 
what's uh, uh, interesting about Santa Ana is it's almost all the ore outcrops. And the other thing is, is I bet you there are, even between the two drill areas I indicated, one by Condor in 2014 and the other by us in 2020, I bet you there's uh, 18 addits where you can actually access and sample vein. And when you saw the support for nine targets we have, every one of those has channel cuts that are similar to the horseshoe grades. So I'm saying 30% uh, of, a, of a, any given vein will be productive, but it actually is better than that. And there are, it's, it's, you have basically the project sits in the middle of the Marikita silver belt, probably the best section of the belt. It's been, it's been mined primitively for uh, over 500 years. And uh, you've, you've given you that access and that insight into the deposit. It's primitive, but, it, but it, you can sample it. So um, I, th I think, and the other thing, they all crop. So the soils and the trenches, the shoots will be expressed by that. And I'll be surprised if we don't have, uh, if we have any less than one horseshoe, 600 meters of vein. That's a 30% product productivity of the vein. Okay. And then as my last question here, um, you in modeling your orchards, you talk about a 300 meter depth extent. What determines that? Is that the depth of the epithermal system? Is that where it transitions to orogenic? If so, what do you know about the orogenic, or is that just the extent of drilling? No, the extent of drilling is in the epithermal and above, and above 300 meters. But um, I mentioned or tried meant to mention that um, by topography, you know, you have, uh, I showed the, you have 14 kilo, cumulative kilometers of veins. By topography, Topography is where you can see that epithermal to orogenic um, uh, transition and actually put your hand on some, not a lot, the exposure is not that good in, on parts of that level, but you can, you can look at orogenic type mineralization and also see the transition by walking that elevation uh, profile into the epithermal. Just topographic wise, there's at least uh, 800 meters of mineralization from surface. Okay, gotcha. So, All right, I'm going to move on, move on to Darren here. Um, you certainly talked, Darren, about being well ahead on your underground development and uh, accessing more stopes, advantages that that, that, that is offering. Um, what right now is the critical path to achieving your goal of first order delivery to the mill in December? Yeah, so we're, uh, you know, as you, as you know, we're a brownfield site with an existing processing plant, tailings management facility. Uh, we're underground right now with uh, well advanced on our pre-production development. Uh, when you look inside the mill uh, through the winter months, we went through and completed a, a, a complete mechanical and electrical audit. Uh, we've certified all the electrical works in there and, uh, and we started to remove things that are going to be replaced. At the end of the day, you're going to see effectively a brand new mill with a new ball mill, which will upgrade it to 800 tons per day from 600. Uh, we've got a gravity circuit going in. Um, we've got uh, you know a new gold room that will be in place, a batch plant for supplying to the underground. These are all new works. In terms of the critical long lead items, you know we have 45 procurement packages that we've placed. It's about 80% by value, so we've locked in pricing there. Uh, the far are all are on schedule to meet our, our December first order delivery to the mill. The most critical of those would be the ball mill. And so that ball mill is scheduled for arrival in July timeframe, and, and that really is the most critical on the long lead path. Okay. So looks like looks good for now, but uh, hopefully COVID doesn't do anything crazy, but uh, at that point you just track it and it looks good. Yeah, we're obviously monitoring all of those packages extremely closely. You know, 90% of them are coming from Canada, the U.S. We had a, a structural steel and pre-engineered building arrive from California a couple of weeks back on, right on schedule. So we're in daily contact with all the vendors and, and monitoring it very closely, but uh, no, no issues thus far. Okay. Um, I don't mean to, to harp on you with M&A questions, but just another one that came in. Obviously, there was, uh, you know, Evolution taking over or buying out the Red Lake mine from Newmont um, a little while back here. Can you talk about what that has meant for you, for investor interest in valuations, for outlook for the, for the region? I'm sure this is a topic that you get asked about a lot. So what comments do you have on the importance of Evolution's move into the area? 
Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited to, to have a Evolution as a neighbor. Uh, it's a renewed focus, if you will, for the Red Lake Mine Complex. As you know, they've been mining there continuously since the mid 1940s. Uh, you know, they're they're deeper, had about two and a half kilometer depth with respect to mining. Uh, Evolution's come in with a, a real focus on on discovery and and turning the turning the eye around. So it's renewed in the time. It's renewed excitement. It's a it's a key part of their portfolio, and so we're excited about that focus. And the town is pretty energized as well. When you look more broadly between uh, a new neighbor, the work that we're doing on site here, building a brand new mine, and and some of the exploration work that's happening in and around the camp, it's it's brought more I think a positive energy into the Red Lake story, and and really excited about that. You know, with respect to M and A, just to elaborate on that, you know, I think that you know my view is what companies look for are the same things that we look for: strong, stable jurisdiction, high grade, size potential, and growth. And and so those are the things that we clearly see with respect to our own project, and we make us attractive, I think, to a whole suite of you know of companies out there. Gotcha. Um, last question. Uh, I, uh, tying together the Canadian dollar gold price and obviously the fact that you are um, coming into a producing, pr coming into being a producer in the next sort of six, seven months. What do you see as the re-rating opportunity for pure gold? Um, I mean, re-rating is a thing that happens as people move from spending money into making money. So yeah, how would you characterize the re-rating opportunity at pure gold? No, absolutely. It's something that, you know, I've, I've heard over the last couple of years with respect to potential investors, you know, really interesting, like the story, can hardly wait in production a little bit early right now. So I think that re-rating is real and you do see it time and time again. And I think there's a couple of things to really elaborate on here. You know, one, first and foremost, we've got a scalable asset and we're taking a phased approach to it. We saw an opportunity to carve out, you know, a million ounce reserve out of a broader um, larger resource and move forward and generate near term cash flow. But there's a bigger picture behind that. If you just look at the phase one um, mine plan alone and the cash flow that we generate, uh, you know, today we're trading about half times NAV. Producers typically trade around one times NAV. So there's a real strong opportunity for re rate, even if we don't find anything else. But we've already made discoveries outside of that uh, phase one footprint. As I said, we've already done some early stage engineering. We're continuing to drill to grow those. And so I think there's a next phase that we can bring on fairly quickly uh, within our mine plan. And then thirdly, just looking at the scale of the system and the open nature down to you know 2.1 kilometers in terms of drilling we have in place there, there is an opportunity for a real transformative discovery here. Something will generate incredible value for shareholders moving forward. All right. I will, uh, we're supposed to try and wrap this up in, in six minutes. So I'm going to move on and, um, and ask Brian a few store, a few questions. Um, one of them is about the backstory here. Uh, this is obviously a massive land position, uh, the pen project in, you know, uh, a, a popular gold belt. So can you just out of interest, can you, I mean, I see it as you put together some fragmented land, that had never had the grassroots approach um, that it deserved in, in terms of exploration. So can you just tell us what your grassroots exploration approach was and why you used it? This is the, the gold grains and till story. I, I, I quite like it. And I, I think when I talk to people about GFG, there's a lot of geologists who are really keen on that aspect of the story. Sure, Gwen. Um, we first looked at part of this land position almost seven years ago. And it was always clear that it was underappreciated from a geological and structural understanding. Um, and you always have to find the right opportunity to put it together. So we, we did the deal with, we bought Rapier, we bought off Probe and Alamos and, Igni and uh, Cisco and put it together. And the thesis was such that, look, the till coverage in that area isn't that complex. It's not 50, 60, 70, 80 meters thick like it used to, it's east of Timmins. It's 5, 10, 15. It's generally single sheet. And based on the work we'd done on looking at what you could find there with till and would it work, we were very confident it would work. And, and if you looked at the government data sets, there was a hole there, very few coverage, uh, limited coverage from government data sets. So we adopted uh, a very detailed method methodology for till geochemistry and, and things like boundary, things like slate rock and Broadway, those are targets that we've generated off till that have equivalent threshold anomalies to what sits on probe and Borden. So we knew there's relevant gold systems at work based on the endowment of the golden till. And we knew 
we were close to them because the gold grains were all very pristine and we also knew the pathfinder signatures to them so i think we do more with till gold golden till than anybody else and and it's led us to find new systems in that belt and in reality when you have 60 kilometers of belt to me the best filter you can have is a layered approach but you need a good geochemical filter that assesses regional prospectivity and in this environment till was best for it so that's why we chose it okay um okay um alamos obviously just came in as an investor into the gfg story a uh, bit of a perhaps a tough question but if you had to pin i was going to say if you had to pinpoint one thing that they identified with most strongly i mean you may end up making that two or three things i can appreciate but if you had to just pinpoint one thing what was the thing that hooked them as an interested party so look it's this location um you you have to look at these belts and see something you like in terms of the location of prospectivity. And if we made a list of who was going to be interested in GFG's Timmins two years ago, at that time, Alamos was top of the list because they have two mills within 150 kilometers of us. They have a commitment to the belt um, and they have a mandate to go and do these with technical teams they like and believe in. So there's so many reasons why they would have, but ultimately you just have to boil it down say, they had mandate and we were in the location that is leveraged. They are leveraged to success, our success. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, question about Arsino pyrite and uh, concerns about refractory ore or what, what, uh, yeah, what the Arsino pyrite levels tell you. Yeah. The, you mean the, the closest sulfide proxy to gold we see at the nib target is pyrotite. Arsino's there. Um, you know, most of the Arsino refractory challenges you have are when you actually don't have coarse gold, you've got gold tied up in the sulfide. Um, the fact that we logged significant visible gold through those intervals, you know, he tells you it's probably not that big of an issue. That said, look, this is one hole, you're very early stage. I'm definitely not a metallurgist. Um, but from a high level, you can look at it and say, coarse gold, you can see it, it's tied to sulfides. I don't think it's a big issue at this stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with it from a uh, targeting and, and, and management, managing that challenge that some more bodies have. I don't see it yet for us. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Brian. And to give Carrie the last few minutes of the Q and A. Um, first, straightforward carry why isn't generation mining uh listed and listed on the tsx or the tsxv we um originally started off the company as a as a uh, an offshoot of pine point mining which we sold to osisco in 2018 and we were a private company and we listed to save money we listed on the canadian stock exchange we have applied uh, to a more senior exchange, um, and then the COVID thing hit, and the people at the exchange stopped showing up. Um, the conversation has started again. We've uh, finished our AIF, and we're moving that along as quickly as we can. Okay, fair enough. Um, the scale and stage of the marathon deposit um situate that in the context of PGE projects sort of globally? I mean, you say there's no mines under construction other than Platte Reef. Uh, talk about sort of the development stage assets, which is what you put Marathon on that list. Uh, yeah, how does Marathon fit into, into that scene? There are three, to my knowledge, only three projects in the world that are uh, at the PEA stage or, or, or more advanced. The most advanced one, other than Platte Reef, is the um, uh, Platinum Group Metals uh, in South Africa. A big project. Um, it, it's uh, it's done a feasibility study. They're moving that ahead. Long time. It's a long time frame. I think it's something like eight years once they start till they get into full production. And, and, and so that's uh, or maybe it's 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 a little less than that. But it's um, so. Then the only other two are us and uh, a company called New Age Metals, which is uh, in, around Sudbury. Uh, they've got probably about sixty percent of our losses, and they've probably got uh, significantly lower grade than ours. Um, but it's you know at, at high palladium prices that might uh, that might work as well. So there's just the three of them that are at the stage of economics. The other ones are all exploration, and most of the those ones are sub um, sub a million ounces. Um, so they're not that big. They need to grow. So if Marathon is uh, does sort of stand out in the PGE project landscape, you've only had it for a year. How did 
how did you snag the asset? I mean, I know the story, but I, I like it. Like how, it's, yeah, it's quite an asset to snag when Palladium was already well moving. Well, we, um, uh, if you know my background, I've always been uh, uh, <clears throat> commodity focused, and uh, we just, when we decided palladium was a way to go, we looked at the world. What what and, and there wasn't much available. Uh, I went to the PDAC. There wasn't one palladium company other than North American Palladium uh, in the entire um, show show there. So I <clears throat> I knew that um, it was going to be tough to find one. Looked at what was available, um, and this was really one of the only ones that was available. So we knocked on their door. We uh, Jamie uh, Levy, our president, uh, started bugging Sabani um, in late 2018, and finally we got some traction. We showed them our track record. Um, they said, okay, we, uh, if we didn't like it, we would sell it to you 100%, but since we actually like it, we'll only sell you 80%. And, um, but Sabani, as you know, doesn't, uh, has not been mine builders. They've been very successful acquiring mines, and um, so they, they got rid of most of their exploration assets. Perfect. Okay. I'm just going to answer questions that were directed at me before we wrap this up. One of them is, if I come across a gold miner that is looking for private investors before becoming a public company, should I invest now or wait? Um, obviously, that depends on your um, risk profile and time frame as an investor. My approach to that is that I generally invest in private companies that have a clear um, timeline to a public listing, uh, simply because this is I always look at relative appreciation potential and I want stocks that if they perform, I can use that capital uh, or at least part of it to, you know, roll into the next part of the next opportunity in the market. Um, gold markets are fast and fierce when they get going and you want to be able to be uh, nimble uh, within them. So I certainly invest in private companies. Um, I include private companies in my premium investment opportunities um, uh, list, but I always want one that has a timeline and not just talking about a timeline, but you know, things are already in motion towards a public listing. But again, that's my, um, outlook. That's not necessarily what everybody, um, what everybody looks for. And then another one is could another general market sell off in the coming months, take the price of gold bullion and miners down. This is obviously the $60,000, although that number is sort of an arbitrary and meaningless number these days. Anyway, um, yes, that's certainly a possibility. My take on this is that the gold market has had the time to build the momentum um, over the last six months, uh, six months, six weeks, six to eight weeks. Um, that it has, it certainly has the possibility of staying strong through a market sell-off, and the reason for that is. When the markets crashed in March, that was a panic situation. Obviously, the ground was shifting under everyone's feet in an incredibly unnerving way. Um, it led to panic, and in panic, everybody sells everything. My outlook is that the next leg down in the broad markets won't be driven by panic. It will be driven by information and you know the pessimists winning out over the optimists to sort of capture it in a broad way. Um, and I think it'll be more of a grind as opposed to a drop. And in a grind, investors have the opportunity to think and hedge instead of just selling everything. So my outlook is that gold certainly has the opportunity to um, at least stay st stable, if not attract investment as a hedge against downside in the broad market, should those markets slide. And that is precisely why gold outperforms um, or performs first out of crashes compared to the stock market because it provides that hedge roll once the initial panic is over. Of course, I, if, it, if panic does return for whatever reason, then gold will remain um, vulnerable to that. But I, that's, that's my take on, on that broad question. And with that, my friends, we're actually only five minutes overtime on our session. So I am going to wrap it up here. Thanks very much to our five presenters for your uh, presentations and for answering questions. Uh, and thanks very much for listening in. We certainly appreciate your interest. Um, please contact the Metals Investor Forum or go to any company website. If you have any more questions for these guys, they would be more than happy to answer them, um, as would I if you have any questions for me. Mm -hmm.